This video has been a long time coming. Returning viewers of this channel have likely heard me mention this subject a few times, as it very often comes up in the other series on this channel where I attempt to craft realistic versions of established monsters, mostly in the case of hexapod vertebrates. To kick this one off, I should make one thing clear. The beauty of fantastical settings is that each may vary widely, which makes it difficult to construct any guidelines that would fit all and not be extremely vague at the same time. However, most worlds tend to be based on our own, therefore I'll take that as a default and build on it where necessary. Although, as a proper start, I should emphasize I'll mostly be talking about creatures with a spine here. No, I should narrow it down even further. Amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals and creatures very similar to them. My reasoning? Plausibility. I will shift my focus from invertebrates for now, as it is leaks easier to justify any number of limbs for them. Even though if we go through the classes of these animals the number of limbs is specific to each, there is a lot more variance than between vertebrates. Among arthropods, legs can range between a variety of numbers. If you narrow it down to arachnida, for example, 8 is the standard. Although if we move on to millipedes, they can have between a few dozen to a couple hundred legs. However, this is mostly tied to the fact that the number of their legs is closely tied to their segments, and it would only take a mutation to increase or decrease those, and we already have a new creature with a different number of limbs. Indeed, if the animal is sufficiently simple or has such an evolutionary quirk, the variation is not too much of an issue. But we are not really here to discuss such cases. So, vertebrate limbs. What kind of limbs are we talking about exactly? Generally speaking, ones with bones, tentacles or other oddities for the sake of this video will not be considered as proper limbs. While very few living vertebrates have anything close to such appendages, I will not discount their possibility. However, since they require no bone structure or an intricate connection to the skeleton, the evolution of such accessories is not that much of a stretch. Dragons, angels, basilisks, or even snakemen of the myriad imaginary worlds possess a number of limbs unusual for our real-world vertebrates. Therefore, they do need a bit of work to justify their unprecedented physique. The existence of such species has huge implications for natural history, not to mention how their typical design would be highly unlikely to ever evolve. Looking at you, angels. Speaking of design, the extra or missing limbs would lead to many difficulties or potential advantages one would have to consider when placing these beasts or people into their world. These are ideas and would be realities that are seldom, if ever, considered. Also, there must always be a reason for those limbs to stay, for if they had no use, the evolution would take its toll quite rapidly. All in all, there's a lot more work to be done beyond there be dragons for those interested in their similitude. Before we finish the introductory portion though, I must also declare that many of the points I am going to raise here only apply to worlds that develop naturally, much like our own. Few of these issues could be raised for a setting created by deities where evolution has, at best, a very limited role, and the possible creatures are possible. Hence, I'll not really focus on such cases, although there might very well be thoughts that apply there as well. Enough tiptoeing around, let's move on to the first point revolving around evolutionary origins. Now, I generally like to place this section towards the end when discussing or creating monsters or the like. I think most people follow the same logic, retroengineering a general design they have in mind, and their evolutionary history is something that is there to fine-tune it, generally altering its appearance and properties in a rather limited capacity. Additionally, evolution and natural history is seldom the focus of any setting. It is very likely that it would not naturally come up throughout the story, especially if such a subject is unknown to the participants. It is an auxiliary feature, something that is good to have in your back pocket, deepening the realism of the world as well as a fertile ground for new ideas without being truly crucial. However, to sufficiently explore this subject, this is something I must not omit, as it is required to pinpoint issues with traditional tropes. I have already very briefly explored the possibility of how a six-limbed vertebrate might evolve under the right circumstances in my Griffin video, where I designed a somewhat plausible version of the beast. Since six seems to be the magic number of such fantastical beings, let's begin with that. In the case of any excellent creature, I suggest going back to a time where vertebrates were only on the verge of moving on to land. This accomplishes two things at once, both of which are imperative. 
First, if we establish a single ancestral being just as a concept that led to hexapods, we already justified as many species as we'd like. On the other hand, if we go on a case-by-case -case study of how a dragon and a griffin got their extra set of legs separately, that would not only be harder on us, but weaken the audience's suspension of this belief. Such incredibly unlikely mutations or accidents occurring consistently is more prone to raise an eyebrow or two than common ancestry. As the second boon, we also make it less of a stretch, a more plausible development. Fish come in all shapes and sizes, and the number of their fins or other similar structures can vary widely. They are unbelievably diverse, and the difference between an early design and a modern species is immense. As an added bonus, since ancient fish double as primal vertebrates too, their skeletons are usually little more than some bones and cartilage. If you go back even further to this era, the appearance of extra fins here and there is a little more likely as they do not need to immediately be a perfect fit for the skeletal structure. However, there are a few ways to do it, which does not necessitate such an early development. Allow me to quickly go over the options I could think of. Let's go chronologically. During the transition from jawless fish to jawed fish, or throughout the evolution of the latter, one or more tucks of fish with extra fins evolve. These fins possess bones, and during their move to land, they become additional primitive legs. As for the why? Well, that is a very good question. However, before I move away from this option, I must say this is among the most realistic. So much so, it could have very easily happened in our own world, would these extra legs provide a tangible advantage. There are many fishes which have the necessary build to support the evolution of more limbs. For a sufficiently old example, take a look at coelacanths, or better yet, the extinct Eustenopteran species. Look at the anal fin, almost taunting to become another pair of legs. Alas, it did not happen, precisely because it did not grant an advantage. But could it? This brings us to two more options which might offer solutions the previous one does not, making them potentially better. For this we have to imagine the Devonian period or any equivalent, where animals with a spine first ventured onto land. There are two specific designs that could theoretically work for us. The first one is something akin to what I use for my realistic griffin. A fish with legs. For example, fins of bat fishes are used to stroll along the sea floor. Under some unique circumstances, these fins might develop a fully supported bone structure upon moving onto land, aiding the rocky transition. Since their function is already to support walking, they would definitely be a useful addition. The other option is rather similar to both of the previous ones. So the issue with the Eustenopteron's last fin that did not make the cut is mostly its position. Now, if we take a few liberties, and in this most crucial of times introduce a fish with a more modern design, not unlike the carp, we have a better distribution. Here there are four potential legs up front, and hind legs still have a fin to evolve from. Again, the argument could be made that six primitive limbs to drag yourself through the primordial mud is better than four, reducing the chance of accidentally beaching yourself for good. Although, as with all others until now, we get to the question, which is arguably the whole point of this entire segment. Why would these extra limbs not devolve over time? Sure, they might be nice training wheels, but beyond that, what is their function? They are a big investment on the part of the animal. Could they give enough of an advantage not to be completely overshadowed by tetrapods? Yes, I think so. I truly believe that the initial portion is the key to it, as it would be unlikely to happen in later geological periods since competition would be far too brutal for them to get a foothold on land. However, hexapods do have some advantages which might just be enough for them to rival tetrapods. First off, easier traversal over rough terrain and better climbing capabilities. With a more stable balance and more limbs to grab or step onto stuff, this is a given. Also, one broken or severed leg when you have six is not much of a problem, so this would also grant them higher resilience to injuries. With the last benefit, I am going to mention how everything is linked neatly to many common monsters and races. The modification of legs to serve other purposes is a very common phenomenon. Just look at your own hands, or my wings. Having more limbs opens up a lot of possibilities. I already mentioned the griffin, which makes up for a somewhat cumbersome flight with superior land traversal 
and fighting capabilities. The general idea of a centaur-like creature is a likely development as well, since their stature would have to change a lot less to obtain hands compared to tetrapods. As a counterpart to wings, specialized fins or flippers that are not used on land are also possible. These beasts would swim better than animals that retain their legs, like otters, while being able to walk far better than ones with flippers, like a seal. Therefore, we have ample justification to include a variety of hexabots in a realistic setting. However, I want to extend this section by taking a look at other numbers beyond 6. Since examples for these are a lot scarcer, I am going to also mention concrete ones, found mostly in mythology. Although this list is not entirely my doing, I had a tremendous amount of help from people on my Discord channel and I cannot thank them enough. If you like world building, mythologies, monsters or anything alike, I'd like to invite you as well. There's a link in the description through which you can join. Now that I've plugged the server, let's continue with the meat of the video. Octopods are the next on the list. As for examples, there's Sleipnir, the eight-legged horse, the Bambird has six legs and two wings, and the Jejunees are six-armed giants. These show quite a bit of variety with a diverse use for all those limbs, but that's something for a bit later. So is there any way they could evolve in a theoretical world similar to ours? While it requires a bit more mental gymnastics, it is plausible, I'd say. Even though we cannot possibly use any bony fish for this purpose, there are still options. Some animals with a cartilaginous skeleton possess more fins than most other aquatic creatures. The Acanthodians, for example, have been found to contain a few of such examples. These ancient designs allow for an alternate present where such animals were not doomed to extinction by the appearance of bony fish, but instead became bony themselves. This could lead to vertebrates with 8, 10, or maybe even 12 limbs. While harder and harder to justify with the increase in legs, I'd say these numbers are not impossible. Making these appendages more diminutive than those of species with fewer could be just the thing that makes them realistic. I'd like to take a deeper look at possible shapes in the next section, so for now, I'll only say that they likely resemble arthropods a bit more than tetrapods. Speaking of which, how much could we increase this number? Are centipede or millipede-like beasts with a spine possible? Even those are justifiable, yes. Although we do have to take a different approach. Say there was a fish species which adapted to strolling on the seafloor, using leg-like structures to both move along the coral reefs and give some minimal propulsion while swimming. In fact, such a creature might be among the first vertebrates to ever set foot on land, joining the arthropods of its time. There are two more options to also go over here. I know this section is already extremely long for how little it ultimately affects a given narrative, but this is more of a resource to go off of, so I should be thorough. Earlier on I mentioned snake people, creatures with only two limbs, which could include a variety of things. From Medusas to Alits, these monsters are not uncommon. Thing is, similar animals already exist. In my other series, I've already mentioned the Mexican mole lizard, the siren, or numerous aquatic mammals. These beasts are more plausible than they seem. If one pair of limbs has no use, it would likely devolve. Individuals that are born with a mutation that reduces or removes the appendage would have to expend less resources and have an edge. Therefore, this trait would have a higher chance to be passed on as it would increase survivability. While the examples I provided a bit earlier encompass species that have lost their hind legs, four limbs can also be lost under the right circumstances. Take the kiwi for example. Its wings are practically useless at this point and I could picture a future animal that lets go of it entirely. With that one justified, there's only one case left. While this is not too common in modern media, it might very well be something you would like to add. An odd number of limbs. I also have quite a few examples to highlight here. The Kui is a cow with a single leg. Cyapods have one leg and two arms. A Hellhead is a horse with three legs. The Jinchan is a frog with a missing hind leg. Puyo have two heads and three legs. The Sanzugui is a turtle with, yet again, three legs. The Baifeng has a single leg and two wings. And the Yatagarasu has three legs with two wings. Are any of these plausible? Well, I would not categorically say no. I'd say the same rule applies here as for the previous bunch. 
if there is a good reason for the limb to disappear, it can. However, it is high time to transition to the next section if we are going to see how functional these beasts would be. So to tie this portion up, let me draw some conclusions. With enough thought, any number of limbs could theoretically evolve. As for how this should be incorporated into a setting without sounding too forced, while also providing a little detail for those looking for truly immersive worlds, my advice is to always include other animals with the same number or even function of limbs, preferably something along the more primitive side, to show it as a representation of a step on the evolutionary ladder the species in question climbed. Or this talking for something that could be summarized in two lines? Yes, as I've said I want this to be something that inspires while also walking people through the thought process. It would be a bit odd to encourage people to justify details of their world without providing any details myself. Alright, let's move on, as this video is already right on track to be quite lengthy. We have explored evolution, but we did little in the way of reviewing the designs themselves or critiquing the usual look of such creatures. In this second half, I aim to do just that. Again, let's take the most common version first, hexapods. I already touched on this earlier, but I do believe their general look does not have to significantly differ from that of tetrapods. The difference itself would be in their genetics. See, hexapods would have to go through the same steps to evolve feathers or hair, but they very well could. All of this can be substantiated by convergent evolution, a term I also use here and there in my creature crafting series. It refers to the way living organisms can develop similar features to solve the same problem. It can also simply refer to the evolution of shapes that are akin to each other, but that is not too relevant for us. There are many great examples, especially in the case of swimming animals. Fins and flippers, a similar body shape, all to facilitate a singular purpose. Propulsion under the waves. Cetaceans and bats both use echolocation. Bats also share another future with birds or even pterosaurs. Wings. Therefore, while not a necessity, amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals, or rather very similar classes could develop for these brand new superclasses. Concerning their skeletons though, there would be quite a difference. The design has to accommodate for extra limbs, which also means places for the additional muscles to attach to. Without going into too much anatomical detail, as I am not an expert in this regard, not that I am an expert in general, Mandatory display of basic humanity aside, it is a good rule of thumb to take a look at what nature has already designed and replicate that. Extra shoulder bones or alternatively an extended pelvis are perfectly adequate solutions. This is a bit more complicated for creatures with flight. Light bones and strong wing muscles are a must. This means the very likely inclusion of a keel to provide anchoring, which would definitely show on the outside. Also, hexapods would bound to be smaller than their four-legged equivalents. They'd have to support the weight of extra limbs after all, which would also require nutrition and oxygen-rich blood. They'd be always heavier than they seem. Increased lung capacity or changes in the circulatory system can be assumed easily, but know that they need more food than a tetrapod of comparable size. Also, this does throw a branch into their flight, forcing them to either give up more weight elsewhere or suffer a clumsier disposition. Now, I did say they'd bound to be smaller, but there is another side to this. Beside food, water and oxygen, supporting the weight of a huge body is a detractor when it comes to an immense size. This is the reason elephants, rhinos and even sauropods have pillar-like legs. Another set would likely go a long way in the struggle to properly prop up those towns. Therefore, hexapods might have quite a behemoth. I'd also make the claim that a stature designed for running might be too awkward with six legs, making it less efficient than a tetrapod. The extra weight, the way the front legs hinder the ones directly behind, which barely provide anything as they are presumably used in tandem to be able to move, it just doesn't fit. The only benefit I could imagine would be some additional strength behind the steps, but the difference is likely not going to be worth it as the acceleration and top speed would also be reduced by the awkwardness, added weight and extra calories burned. While it might seem difficult to catch such problems, it really isn't. Just imagine an ordinary day in the life of such a creature and see if anything crops up. 
In other words, don't do what Avatar did and say everything has six legs low. Oh no way, do you want our aliens to be relatable? Make them like us, but horrible. Slight tangent, I know some people absolutely love these abominations, but I seriously get nauseous just looking at them. I don't know what it is, but they perfectly fit into the uncanny valley for me. The limbs, the faces, ugh. Anyway, we should move on to critiquing common hexapod designs, which should give you a good idea of what is often lacking. What better creature to begin with than dragons? I have barely seen any that could fly. Let's clarify this early on. Such an enormous flying reptile-like creature would either fly and be rather frail, or be an absolute unit, but never both. I'd also declare the second row of legs to evolve into wings as those could have an uninterrupted membrane run to the tip of the tail, possibly but not necessarily connecting to the hind legs as well. Let's not forget the keel either. Dragons are usually depicted as majestic saurian beasts that fly like a bird and rampage like an elephant on steroids. In a realistic setting it's either one or the other. Additionally, these are not wings just massive fans. What the hell is that part? How is it supposed to generate lift? I'd also limit the number of spikes, frills and horns as they are added weight to an already encumbered flyer. Some are fine, but do not go the chin dragon route. To some extent this also applies to the likes of the griffin, but they are more grounded in this sense. A mixture of avian and mammalian features in the case of a brand new superclass is not impossible. I'd give them larger wingspans and smaller bodies than the average design I see, but it is otherwise sounder. The beak and feathers are massive help for area traversal, although screw the tail. How is this supposed to have flight, come on? Slap a bird tail there instead. Angels or demon-like races would also be poor flyers as they stand. The kill is mandatory, but even that might not be enough. The wings might have trouble generating lift, and the humanoid shape is aerodynamically terrible unless it follows the long extinct tradition of planking, but that would be quite tiring. Making them rather small and bad at flying, mostly gliding from tree to tree might be a solution, but I'm not sure that is what people generally have in mind for them. They did extensive redesigns, something that would change them into different creatures altogether. Centaur-like beings would need a bit of fine-tuning as well. This portion would more or less be the ribcage, but this part might also need some bony protection, and the front leg would need some additional skeletal machinations. Also, the lung has to be massive, not a puny human one, in tandem with the heart. However, the general idea is quite functional, and their appearance could easily predate hominids. Although, since we are talking about a very different creature, they definitely not look this human. The argument also applies to the previous group and many others, but I did not want to beat that dead horse any further, so let's beat this living horse. Convergent evolution might lead them to seem similar to a hominid, but would look quite distinct for any of you. Think of it like this, someone who sees them for the first time might not be able to tell a dolphin from an ichthyosaur. The dolphin, however, wouldn't under any circumstances mistake an ichthyosaur for its kind, so practically make them as revolting as these blue wretches. Another possible design involves the likes of good old Goro. Forearms are… well, is it necessary or beneficial to have two pairs of rather similar limbs? They do a number of balance, not to mention the weird bone structure to accommodate them. How could they ever let these upper arms rest? They wouldn't work in a parallel position either as there would be no space for adequate muscle mass that could move them forward or back individually. It would work like two arms with four hands really. I do not think an upright posture can efficiently support all of this, nor do I see the benefit beyond the luxury of allowable limb loss. This is one of those cases where less is more. However, if we were to reduce the size of the secondary pair of arms, that would present a whole lot of opportunities. A more dexterous pair of hands, perhaps a specialized pair with sharp claws as a backup weapon, an aid in carrying younglings, there are many possibilities. Goro's a no-go though. On the other hand, in case you wish to include a four-flippered aquatic monster, that is perfectly valid. Fish can do quite well with more fins. I do not see why the return to the ocean would necessitate the removal of the extras. As for the last hexapod, I'd also like to take a look at a common six-legged variant of basilisks. 
As my close relatives, I really fancy their usual design, which is actually a sound one. With a lizard-like stature, the extra legs can really help in skittering and climbing treacherous terrain. This is one walking method, where there would be no awkwardness, each set aiding the rest, generating more traction, providing more strength, more grabbers to hold down the prey. In fact, I do believe that any setting that includes hexapods would greatly benefit from the inclusion of such a beast. This would provide a quasi-ancestor, something that took a different evolutionary path from a common predecessor, showing that there is thought behind every detail of the world. I know I'm a bit biased here, but I do think I'd hold this stance anyway. I'm so confident as to extend it to a design I do not particularly fancy. I always thought 8-legged, yes, we have moved on to octopods, basilisks do not look that good. However, if you do wish to include octopods in a setting, it occupies the same role as the hexapod variant, a more streamlined creature to ground others with the same number of limbs. It still would be quite viable as a crawler, a true strider of difficult terrain. As for other versions? Let's take a general look first. Once again, the extra pillars could support heavy bodies, but would need even better circulation and lung capacity. Flight is also less likely, but swimming and climbing are as strong options as ever. What we really need to take into account is the added weight, as these creatures otherwise face similar issues as hexapods. An upright stature is 9, possible, but we'll discuss that in detail a bit later. In the case of octopods, designed somewhat mimicking arthropods are quite likely. Naturally, such a stature would mean a low body weight as the legs would need to work really hard to keep a fat one off the ground. Nonetheless, these would be quite unique beasts. Let's take a look at the creatures compiled by my Discord and see how functional they are. Sleipnir. Not very. I already spoke of how runners with extra legs might not have enough of a boon to justify the drawbacks. It's all around awkward and might very well lead to a more streamlined form with a few devolved limbs. The Bambird. Six legs are a bit too much for something designed for flight. That is a lot of weight to make up for elsewhere with not much of a benefit. While four legs can have an edge or two, this is going a bit overboard. In a sufficiently small size, this might exist, particularly as a skilled wall climber or perhaps as a replacement for draconic or griffin-like beasts, if those are absent. It is a weird case. I could also imagine a version where a pair is more arm-like. Given that the creature builds its nest in small crevices on the side of steep cliffs, putting its eggs and young into holes even the bamboo could not fit, it would use these arms to build and take care of the hatchlings while using the forelegs to secure itself on the rock face. However, that is a very specific creature for a very specific habitat with a lot of caveats. I'd honestly drop it. Jejunees. No. Imagine the strain this would put on their poor spine, not to mention the awkward, always raised arms. Same problems as with Goresque designs. I could, once again, imagine smaller arms serving different purposes, but no ultra massive monstrosities. Beyond these, I'd say six leopard aquatic creatures are just as valid, as there are a few precedents which show it could theoretically work. They do not even need to remain simple flippers, specializing each for different tasks. The sea really is a forgiving place for such monsters. There is one more potential design, akin to centaurs. There are a few ways I could picture it, combining a few features. Four legs, two regular arms and two smaller sets. Perhaps even a basilisk-like crawler with hands. There are a number of possibilities here. Four wings might be another option. I did not mention this at the hexapod portion, but it could also apply there. If said wings are designed in such a way that they do not overlap, but instead help generate more lift, it could justify the extra weight. Therefore, this is more fitting for octopods, as they would be significantly more cumbersome. These creatures would be quite unusual, as I do think a double kill in between legs is necessary, like long birds. Not the most efficient form of life, but perhaps just capable enough to justify its existence. Increasing the limbs even further to 10, 12 or higher. In these cases, I do believe the number is too high to mimic the appearance of tetrapods. Centipede or other millipede-like creatures would be the norm, with legs resembling little stumps. This would keep their design from being too awkward to move while still serving a purpose. 
Date worked much like giant arthropods, their skeletal structure allowing for a larger size and lungs proving to be superior to a trachea system. I could also imagine something a bit like a drider. Spider ladies are quite common and if we remove the abdomen and make it a true vertebrate, it might work. A cave dwelling creature that is adept at climbing and in possession of hands is plausible with that many legs. If you make the front legs double as semi-legs, providing additional arm capacity, that could also work. There are a few interesting aquatic creature possibilities here too, like something eel-like with a long continuous fin system. Imagine the membrane on the limbs as one extensive veil, with the individual body parts more diminutive serving as points at which it can be moved, like pedals. However, this is a rather unexplored area, so I don't intend to spend too much time here. Just keep in mind that these creatures would have to be very specific, requiring much more thought than others. So let's move on to the second to last group, creatures with two limbs. The keyword here will be purpose. There has to be a strong reason for why the hind or front legs disappeared and why the others remained. For front legs or arms, a fossorial lifestyle or swimming are adequate, as proven by real life creatures but the beast has to reflect it. The problem with snake people in general is that they are just worse versions of hominids. Legs are better for upright walking and snakes themselves aren't going to grow their arms back. I suggest to follow these established causes as reasoning is out the window. There might be some unique circumstances you might come up with but remember, the lack of limbs has to give an advantage. Why would they disappear otherwise? Same goes for bipeds with no arms or wings. It is the easiest to justify with birds as flightlessness makes wings redundant. I'd be hesitant to remove functional arms or legs though, but there are a few possibilities. Say this beast is specialized to outrun predators and it is perfectly capable of grazing without front limbs. Two massive strong legs could prove rather effective over large plains. Alternatively, it hunts in a similar manner to whales. Extending its gaping jaws and running through a field filled with small insects that would fly up only to be caught. Speed and redundancy might be adequate reasons here. Again, just a matter of coming up with a justification. The only other aspect you need to be wary of is balance. Don't make them prone to fall over. Speaking of falling over, is an odd number of limbs possible? Uh, Practically the same rule applies here, if one limb is redundant, only one and not the pair, it might disappear. I'd not say it is very likely though. The most plausible I could think of is a creature with two hind legs merged into one. The Jinchan comes to mind. If the frog's leg becomes something halfway between a caudal fin and the jumping leg, that might work. The unified limb providing better propulsion underwater while still offering an option leap to effectively traverse dry land and escape predators. Other possibilities are rather iffy. Perhaps an odd number of wings with one adapted to steer. Maybe an extra leg for birds that can hold prey while standing but providing little additional weight. These are very specific circumstances and many are completely impossible. In this case, the animal has to be closely designed around the number, so monsters like these are completely out of the question. To sum this all up, this video is meant to provoke thought, encourage bold ideas with a solid link anchoring them to reality. The question of limbs, as many other aspects of world building, is all about asking why. Those lovingly crafted words that hold these answers are sure to be the most immersive of them all. I hope this video provides a useful resource to use in your writing endeavors. It was a lot of fun thinking all this through, even though I'll likely stop at hexapods in my own setting. If you've watched this long, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I'd like to mention my Discord channel one last time. This video would likely be significantly shorter if it wasn't for the inspiration. I was originally planning on dissecting a Thunderbird before this one, but that is coming for those interested. Although it will be a few weeks before it is done, I hope to see you then. Bye!